cautions the saints about is the danger of philosophies and the traditions of men. He writes, beginning in verse 8, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. And so the philosophies and the traditions of men was a danger threatening the saints in Colossae, and they are dangers for the people of God even today. Now, having said that, let me say that there is nothing inherently wrong with philosophy and tradition. The word philosophy simply means the love of wisdom. And we're studying the book of Proverbs in our Wednesday night adult Bible class. And the book of Proverbs, as you well know, has a lot to say about wisdom. There is a wisdom from God that God wants his people to appropriate. The wise man writes in Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. In addition to that, the book of Proverbs clearly indicates that God wants his people to love wisdom. In a passage that we looked at Wednesday night, the wise man writes in chapter 4, Beginning in verse 5, get wisdom, he says, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Listen carefully, love her, and she will keep you. God wants us to love wisdom, his wisdom. And the word tradition may have a connotation today that is somewhat negative in our minds, but the word tradition simply means that which is handed down. And the New Testament clearly teaches that there is a tradition that has been handed down from God, and we're to hold on to that, we're to keep that tradition. Paul told the saints in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. God wants his people to keep what he has handed down to them. Paul told the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. So there is a tradition handed down by God that we must respect and hold on to. There are also traditions handed down from men that are permitted by God. When God tells us to do something, but he doesn't specify how we're to go about doing that, we can decide the how. And that how might even become a tradition with us. Have you noticed that here at Cortland Avenue, we have a traditional order of service There are certain things that we do at a certain time. You notice that? Well, there's nothing wrong with that at all unless we get it in our heads. That's the only way to have a worship service. So there are traditions handed down from men that God permits. But then there's a third kind of tradition, and that's what Paul's talking about here There are traditions handed down by men that are not authorized by God. Jesus had a lot to say about that in the seventh chapter of Mark's gospel, and I would encourage you 
to turn there for a moment, and then we'll come back to Colossians chapter 2. Begin reading with me in verse 1. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came to gather to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then Mark writes in verse 5, Then the Pharisees and scribes ask him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? You see, the elders, the Jewish leaders, had handed down certain traditions about ceremonial washings, and that hadn't come from God. And they were binding those man-made traditions on men, and Jesus certainly condemned them for that. These kinds of traditions are wrong and sinful, first of all, because they do not originate with God. Then notice what he says in verse 6 and 7. He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Man-made traditions that God has not authorized make God's commandments of no effect, and they cause our worship to be vain, futile, empty. Notice verse 8, For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. Man-made traditions cause people to lay aside God's commandments. And then notice verse 9, He said to them, All too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition, man-made traditions, unauthorized by God, cause people to reject God's commandments. And then skip down to verse 13. Mark writes, Making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you, hand, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. So man-made traditions that are unauthorized by God cause great harm. Notice, going back to Colossians chapter 2, that Paul says in verse 8 that these man-made philosophies and traditions cheat you. Literally, the word there means to plunder or to take you captive. Man-made traditions and philosophies do not offer what they promise, or rather I should say they don't deliver what they promise. And notice that they do this, Paul says in verse 8, through empty <laughs> deceit. It's not evident Otherwise, people wouldn't be deceived. Satan works through deception. We saw that in the very beginning, did we not? In Genesis chapter 3, as Moses tells us about man's fall into sin. Notice that Paul says in verse 8 that these philosophies and traditions are according to the basic principles of of the world. The word that's translated basic principles basically meant one of a row or a series. The ancients used it 
to talk about the elementary sounds or letters, like the letters of the alphabet, for example. They use the word to talk about the basic elements of the universe. You probably remember from your schooling that the ancients had the idea that the universe was basically made up of four elements, air, earth, fire, and water. Well, they use this word to talk about those basic elements. And then they use the word to talk about the ABCs of a particular system. Seems to me that that's probably the way Paul is using the word here. Now we need to realize that we're faced with similar influences today. The people of God are affected by such philosophies as atheism and evolution and humanism. The traditions of men, and remember I'm talking about the unauthorized traditions of men, are found rampant in Protestant denominationalism, in Roman Catholicism, and various cults. And while these man-made traditions may have a lot of truth in them, it's the error in these traditions that lead men astray. I think I've mentioned before that when I was a boy I remember my dad talking about the fact that rat poison is 99% inert material. It's not going to hurt you. It's that 1% of poison that's going to kill you. Well man-made tradition is a lot like that. There's a lot of it that is innocent and harmless, even true, but it's that small percentage that will hurt you spiritually. We need to keep in mind, as Paul emphasizes in Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, that in Jesus Christ are found all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We need to remember that Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, as Paul tells us in verse 9. What does that mean? Well, that means that the sum total of all that God is, all of His being, all of His attributes dwelt in Jesus. Brother Elmer Moore was a well-known Texas preacher. Don't know if he did that much preaching outside of Texas, but I remember Brother Moore saying that Jesus was God as God is and man as man ought to be. And that statement has just stayed with me. Jesus was God as God is and man as man ought to be. That means that Jesus did not surrender his deity in, at his incarnation. And he did not give up his humanity at his resurrection. As we think about these philosophies and traditions of men, we need to remember, as Paul says in verse 10, that in Jesus Christ we are complete. All of our spiritual needs are met in him. There's nothing that we need that's not in Christ. And since Christ is the head of all principality and power, we have nothing to fear from those spiritual beings if we are firmly in union with Christ. So Peter says, in essence, believer, beware of the philosophies and the traditions of men. Well, then in the next several verses, Paul warns the Colossians about the danger of Judaistic ceremonialism. Look at verses 11 and following. 
In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive to gather with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. One of the big problems that first century Christians faced was the fact that there were some Jewish Christians who believed that in order for Gentiles to be accepted by God, they basically had to become good little Jews. They had to be circumcised and they had to keep the law of Moses. Luke writes about that in Acts chapter 15 when he says, beginning in verse 1, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Luke tells us that Paul and Barnabas had a great a dispute with those fellows and it was decided to go down to Jerusalem and, and consult with the apostles about all of this and they did that. And if you skip down in Acts 15 to verse 5, Luke says, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And so this problem taught by the Judaizers was a problem that they dealt with in Acts chapter 15, and it was a problem that Paul addressed in several of his letters, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, and here in Colossians. Paul deals with this problem by pointing out that through baptism into Christ, we experience, by that I mean the Christian experiences, a true circumcision, which is the cutting away of the body of the flesh. I'm planning to come back and, and talk about the circumcision of Christ in a separate lesson and look at what Paul says here in more detail. But I'm just mentioning basically what Paul is saying in this portion of scripture. In his death, Jesus took the old law out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And so, Paul tells these saints in Colossae in verse 16 and 17, don't let anybody judge you in matters pertaining to the old law, the Jewish feast, the new moon celebrations, the Sabbaths. The word that is translated judge here sometimes carries with it the idea of condemn. And it seems to me that that's the way Paul is using the word in this context. He's saying, don't let anybody condemn you if you don't practice this Judaistic ceremonialism. Well, I'm sure you know that there are religious groups even in our own day and age that try to go back and bind elements of the old law on Christians today. Seventh-day Adventists, for example, teach that Christians should observe the Sabbath. And they bind some of those old food regulations from the law of Moses. Roman Catholics teach that there is a separate priesthood. And so they have their own clergy. 
Well, as people who are in Christ, we need to remember that we have died to the law of Moses and to the Jewish ceremonialism associated with that. In Romans chapter 7, Paul writes in verse 1, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Paul states that as a basic fundamental principle. And then he goes on to illustrate that principle by talking about the marriage relationship. And basically he says that married people are bound to one another until one of them dies. And if you join yourself to someone else, then you're an adulteress. But then Paul comes back to his main point when he says in verse 6, But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. We've been set free from the law of Moses. And Paul told the Galatians in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He goes on to explain just a few verses later, that anyone who would attempt to be justified by the law of Moses is actually fallen from grace. And so Paul says here, in essence, believer, beware when people try to impose upon you things that are based upon the law of Moses. Paul wants us to remember that we are complete in Christ. Well, then he warns them about the danger of the worship of angels. He says in verse 18, Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Well, we might ask ourselves the question, why would anybody want to worship angels? Well, Paul doesn't really address that question in this passage. But when you stop and you think about it, there are various reasons that we might propose. Perhaps folks had the idea that they needed angels as some kind of intercessors. Perhaps it was out of a sense of humility. They felt like that they couldn't go to God directly themselves. What's the problem with the worship of angels? Well, Paul tells us in verse 9... He says that it really results from a false humility based upon our own vain imagination. That's a, the New Testament clearly teaches that the people of God need no other mediator or intermediary beside Jesus Christ. Listen to the words of the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And then the writer says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is the only mediator that we need. Worshiping angels actually 
winds up diverting us away from Christ, who, according to Paul, is the rightful head of the body. He mentions that in verse 19. May I also remind you quickly that on one occasion when John got so caught up in the emotion of the situation that he started to bow down before the angel that was revealing various things to him in the book of Revelation. And the angel said, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets. That angel refused to accept that kind of worship. Well, today there are some religions who have developed what we might call a counterpart to the worship of angels. I'm sure you're well, of the, well aware of the fact that our Roman Catholic friends venerate Mary. And they venerate the saints. And so they pray to Mary and they pray to the saints. Now they try to make a distinction between what they call veneration and worship. But in all practicality, it's a distinction without a difference. And the result is the same. Not holding fast to the head. You see, that was the result when some worshipped angels in the first century. That's the same result today when people venerate anyone other than Jesus Christ. Well, then the last danger that Paul warns the saints about is the danger of asceticism. He says, beginning in verse 20, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men? These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Down throughout the centuries, asceticism has often been offered as a key to self-control. This was especially prominent in the Middle Ages when people would wear shirts made out of hair. Now imagine wearing a garment made out of hair. How uncomfortable that would be. Um, they slept on hard beds. They would whip themselves. They would go for days, maybe even years, without speaking to anyone. They would go without food or, or sleep. Seems like I, I remember reading about somebody that went up on a pole and he just lived up on a pole uh, for, for, well, I don't know how long. It's a long time. There was that idea that these ascetic kinds of practices somehow helped you spiritually. They got you closer to God. But Paul clearly tells us here that ascetic practices like that have no real value. And he tells us in verse 20, we've died with Christ from these basic principles of the world. And notice that he says in verses 20, and 20 through 22 that these ascetic rules and regulations pertain to things that perish. They pertain to things that do not last. And he says in verse 22 that they are according to the commandments and doctrines of 
of men. That was really the first danger that he mentions in this passage. What he's saying is these rules and regulations didn't come from God. We have no right to impose rules and regulations on ourselves or anyone else that do not come from God. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, And he goes on to say a few verses later that these doctrines of demons included the teaching that would forbid marriage and would command uh, abstinence from certain foods. Does that remind you of anything in our modern time? Roman Catholicism, for example forbid their clergy to marry and they taught that certain foods were to be avoided. I remember in elementary school we had fish on Friday. Some of you are nodding your heads, yes, you remember that too. And then somewhere along the line that was changed (laughs) by the Catholic Church. So in this passage Paul warns these saints about these four dangers, the philosophies and traditions of men, Judaistic ceremonialism, the worship of angels, and asceticism. And I hope you can see that there are modern counterparts uh, in our own day and age. Thank you for your very kind attention.